And with that raised trombone, Sergeant Andrew Mercer gives a signal to countermarch. And the band will turn ready for that quick march to come in a moment. Familiar figure of senior drum major Scott Fitzgerald of the Coldstream Guards in his final birthday parade. Ordering the quick march, Messine Ridge, we heard about it earlier, composed by Major Bruce Miller. breaks away. 22-year-old Lance Corporal Ricky Laverty from Ballymoney in Northern Ireland, acknowledged to be the best drummer in the battalion, marching to a position just to the right of the escort, ready for the next phase of the parade.
drummer playing eight bars of a field signal called the drummer's call and recalling an age when communications on the battlefield used the drums. Guardsman Rainey, who's from Birmingham, joined the Irish Guards three years ago, marches forward to take the pace stick from Regimental Sergeant Major Daniel Hinton, who will then be able to draw his sword ready to protect the colour in the next phase of the parade. off very smartly to the march of the British Grenadiers. Good moment for men to stretch their legs to take centre stage to show the style and flair that they have, the results of weeks of hard work. It's a great moment for them, Chris. Well, a big moment for the escort, Hugh, a really proud moment that they have spent hours preparing for. The escort drawn from support company, they're the more experienced soldiers in the battalion. It's highly unusual for the company to provide the escort and they won the privilege in a drill competition and today is their award. And when you talk to the men in the escort, thinking back to when I did it, it's a unique honour. And although you may do several of these birthday parades in a career, you're very unlikely to be in the escort more than once, making today a real career highlight for each and every one of them. some 16 paces from the colour pot, ready for the collection to take place. Bands turning to face the colour party. Senior director Kevin Roberts making his way through the band to a new position close to the front. This is a very proud moment for Regimental Sergeant Major Daniel Hinton as he now prepares to take possession of the colour, protecting it with his sword, ready to hand it over safely to the ensign, 2nd Lieutenant O'Connor, who will then troop the colour through the ranks. hand to the new second lieutenant o'connor today's ensign prepares to receive the color ready for the trooping ready to place it safely in his white color belt
Escort to the colour. Present! Up! So the ensigns on Major resumed their positions in the escort and we've now entered a new phase in the parade because the escort for the colour, having taken possession, has now become the escort to the colour. So the escort advances now in slow time. Bands playing Escort to the Colour by Richard Ridings. Very familiar tune. We've played at this point ever since 1978. Very soon the bands will have to negotiate what everyone acknowledges a rather daunting manoeuvre. This is the uh, military equivalent of the three-point turn, that's what they say. It's known as the spin wheel. 200 musicians supported by the core of drums having to change direction without changing formation. Among them is uh, drum major Smiley of the Irish Guards. He wants us to know that his uh, five-year-old son Brandon is watching the parade at home in Datchet. Of course, other people watching from other vantage points to Duchess of Cornwall there in the uh, Major General's office overlooking those guys. Grenadier's Slow March, arranged by Fred Harris. The escort preparing to troop the colour through the ranks. The symbolic foundation of this parade. The specific honour is to parade the regimental standard or colour as a rallying point, as armies have done through the centuries. on the ensign. Her Majesty certainly looking in great detail, but everyone else too, and an audience of millions around the world. Second Lieutenant O'Connor, who was uh, commissioned from Santos last summer, he's been telling us about the honor of being chosen, how he's been preparing for this very prominent role in the parade. I'm very proud to be uh, ensign on the troop. Uh, I'm very much aware of the significance of trooping the color for the Irish Guards. 
It gives us an opportunity to show off and to show our professionalism to the public and hopefully we'll do the regiment and its history justice on the, on the day. A lot of hard work has gone into this, uh, Chris, not just for the ensign, of course, but for all of those taking part in the parade, as you would know, having taken part yourself. Well, absolutely, Hugh, and uh, the memories of 21 years ago are fresh. Um, but looking at it now, the colour has a central part in the parade today, and it's a central part of the battalion. It's of enormous significance, not only for the people on parade today, Irish Guards, past and present. Um, it's a consecrated symbol of the battalion and the regiment. It was used hundreds of years ago as a rallying point in battle. And the act of trooping the colour was to ensure that every man knew what his colour looked like. So today, as much as then, the colours are revered and central part of the battalion. And to all those on parade, it represents the spirit and the soul of the regiment. Those who have been killed in action, our past achievements, and it provides an enduring link with the monarchy, as it's the Queen, as our Colonel in Chief, who presents the colours. And so a really proud moment for the Ensign as he troops the colour in front of his fellow Guardsmen. Driving alongside number two guard and then passing to its original position. Right guide of number two guard, Company Sergeant Major Griffiths. by the Corps of Drums, composed shortly after the Second World War by Drum Major Tom Burkett of the Coldstream Guards as we prepare for the next phase of the Queen's Birthday Parade.
Captain's gone. Close order. March. Number six guard will move to the right in threes. Four threes. Right. Guard will march past in slow and quick time. By the left. Slow. Back. So the trooping phase is complete and the march past is about to begin. We start with a neutral slow march, not tied to any particular regiment, and that neutral march is Proud Heritage, another original composition for the parade by Major Bruce Miller of the Irish Guards. hours of hard work on the parade run bearing fruit. A great sea of scarlet tunics. Such a wonderful and uplifting sight. First Battalion Irish Guards based at uh, Cavalry Barracks in Hounslow, currently employed in state ceremonial public duties, support company. Uh, as Chris, you were saying earlier, a very important part of that effort. Hugely, uh, Hugh, support company are the heavy weapons specialists who man the support weapons in the battalion. That's where the name comes from. And that comprise the anti-tank rockets, the mortars and the sniper rifles. And it is, I think, a reminder that amongst all the pageantry and the ceremonial, uh, that each and every one of these men are highly trained fighting soldiers. Many have got experience in Iraq and Afghanistan or one of the many other deployments that the army is engaged in today. Uh, and the discipline, the teamwork, the attention to detail that you can see today are also the foundation of success on combat operations. And that is what I think makes Gars not only world-class ceremonial soldiers, but also exceptionally successful troops on combat operations. Since 1902, the Irish Guards have had the honour of trooping their colour for the Sovereign on 13 occasions. And, uh, nine of those have been for Her Majesty the Queen. The escort being led by a field officer, Tan Colonel Jonathan Palmer and the Major of the Parade. And as we see, uh, number two guard approaching. Special mention there for Major Charlie Gare, captain of number two guard, who was with Vince Hockley in Afghanistan, Chris. Well, we saw Colour Sergeant Vince Hockley earlier and his remarkable recovery from his wounds. And there's a link there to the captain of number two guard, Major Charlie Gare, who was commanding the patrol on which Vince was shot. And Charlie got the rest of the patrol to safety. He evacuated the wounded. And at the end of the tour, he was ordered a mention in dispatches for his gallantry and his leadership. Bearskins being worn tend to be passed from one generation to the next, by the way. Until recently, we were told that one Coldstream officer was still wearing one that had uh, been used at the Battle of Alma in 1854. Colour being carried now to the front of the escort, ready for the march past Her Majesty. Soon the music will change to the Irish Guard slow march. Field officer, Jonathan Palmer, 
Dominic Olkin, the Major of the Parade, ready now to lead the march past the saluting base. Let her in remember. The ensign lowers the colour, what's called the flourish, as he passes the saluting base. Grenadier Guard Slow March from Handel Scipio. And no doubt one of those watching most keenly at this point is the Colonel of the Grenadier Guards, the Duke of Edinburgh. Guard, slow march, garb of old Gaul. And the third member of the saluting base, the Duke of Kent, is a colonel of the Scots Guards. Coldstream Guards from Mozart's Figaro. And their Colonel is Lieutenant General Sir James Bucknell. And the adjutant of the parade, Captain Max Dewar of the Irish Guards, riding Connor today, served twice in Afghanistan part of the Guard of Honour outside Westminster Abbey for the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge six years ago. Music changes again to the neutral slow march, this time Royal Standard. Field officer, brigade waiting. Then Colonel Jonathan Barmer will ride out to salute the Queen now that the slow march is complete. on Horse Guards Parade today. And many thousands of friends and family present, enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the music, enjoying the drill, the precision and the smartness of the parade. And 
my colleague Sonali has been catching up with one of those very proud relatives, Anita, Anita Ward, mother of uh, Colour Sergeant Vince Hockley, Sergeant to the Colour. I'm with Colour Sergeant Vince Hockley's mother, Anita Ward. Anita, I know you've been at the Queen's Birthday Parade before when you were Lord Mayor of Birmingham, but this is the first time as a proud mum. It is, um, and so so very different from when I was here as, as Lord Mayor. Uh, a lot of pride um, for myself and for the whole family today. And earlier on in the programme, we heard about Vince's injuries. To go from there to being here on parade today just makes it all so extra special, doesn't it? It is, but it's all been down to his own uh, determination, his own willpower, and I have to say the support that he's had from those around him as well including your father who was in the Coldstream Guards. He's going to be watching from home today. He is and he'll be bursting with pride uh, as well. There's been a lot of rivalry over the years between the Coldstreamers and the mix but uh, yeah dad will be in his element today seeing this. Well enjoy the parade. It's such a proud day for the family. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Bursting with pride. Lovely to talk to Anita. We're preparing for the march past in quick time. The word about the pipers, we can see them moving there from the rear to the front of the mass bands. 20 pipers, 10 from the Irish Guards, 10 from the Scots Guards. Such a lot of style and they add such a great quality to the music on the day. So a special mention for them. So the guards have now reformed, ready to march past in quick time. A new change of tempo, led by the senior time beater, Sergeant Neil Brocklehurst of the Scots Guards. Neutral quick march is Star of Erin. Plenty of Irish flair again. Composed by a former senior director of music, Major Jerry Horobin, who wrote this for the birthday parade in 74. Among the spectators in the stands is Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, with uh, distinguished guests, other ministers, including Sir Michael Fallon, the Defence Secretary. We are told that the Prime Minister Theresa May is not here at the parade this morning. As uh, we prepare now for the march past in quick time, in a real sense of energy and pace. Great as well, Chris, to mention all the family support that is so essential in regimental life. Well, indeed, Hugh, the Irish Guards take great pride in being a family regiment, and so many of the men on parade today will, like me, have had a father, an uncle, or another relation in the regiment. For example, in the escort alone, his guardsman, Lee Mooney, who had a father, a grandfather, and a great-grandfather in the regiment. There are two sets of brothers, Colour Sergeant Sean and Lance Corporal Scott Beauville, Lance Sergeant Matty and guardsman James Wright, uh, and guardsman Jacob Todd, one of the colour sentries, had a father in the regiment. And so it's great to see so many Irish Guards families represented on parade. Their families will be in the stands today, sharing this amazing spectacle. Irish Guards quick march, St. Patrick's Day.
great surge of the music of the pipes, giving way to the Grenadier Guards Quick March, the British Grenadiers. Nine Maiden Company, number four guard company had the honor of providing the escort back in 2014. And Scots Guards Quick March, Highland Laddie, F Company, Scots Guards, an incremental company of Scots Guards based at Wellington Barracks. The Coldstream Guards Quick March, Millen Nolo, number six guard, found by number seven company Coldstream Guards this evening. Busier next year, probably for the Coldstream Guards, because we expect that they will be trooping their colour at the birthday parade of 2018. Field officer rides out once again to salute the Queen with two movements of the sword. The mass band's playing the neutral quick march, mix march, arranged by uh, MJ Henderson, former director of Music Irish Guards. The guards reform for the next stage of the parade. Probably a moment's uh, relief for the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Palmer. Great moment for him, family and colleagues. He's been sharing his views with us. It's lovely for me as a commanding officer to be doing something so visible in front of the blokes and to be doing something with most of the battalion. I can shout all I like, but if they don't react to the words of command, then it doesn't work. I think just being in front of the Queen, I think that'll be the lasting memory, because she's an amazing woman. I hope everyone who's on parade today will look back and, even when they're in their dojo, just give it the old, I was there, pull up a chair and listen to my story. It's not a bad aim to have, Chris, is it? Uh, I think it's an entirely reasonable aim, and Jonathan Palmer will be feeling it uh, 100%. I've known him for over 20 years. We met when he first visited the battalion in Germany, when he was thinking about joining the army, and he's now a highly experienced soldier. He's done several tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's a qualified military parachutist, a reflection of the Guard's links with the parachute regiment in, the, in our parachute platoon. He's just three months into his time in command. He learned to ride, especially for the parades we heard earlier with Sonali, and I think it's going well so far for him. Colour is now taken to the front of the escort.
site. The foot guards have reformed. Soon it'll be the turn of the mounted troops to cross the parade ground and to pass the saluting base. Very hot weather here in central London today, presenting a challenge, of course, not just for the men and women in part of this parade, but for the horses too. Mass bands and drums moving to the south side of the parade ground to create space for the uh, mounted bands. that the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery has been on parade. They joined the event at Horse Guards at the request of the Royal Family, first taking part in 1998. King's Troop, essentially the saluting battery of the household troops. Formed uh, back in 1946 at the instigation of King George VI to revive the firing of royal salutes on royal anniversaries and on state occasions. And last Saturday, indeed, they fired a royal salute to mark the Duke of Edinburgh's 96th birthday. of the uh, drum horses, the Damas and Mercury. The drums, by the way, very heavy, given to the lifeguards by William IV in 1831. They weigh around 45 kilograms each. King's Troop, commanded by Major Jim Luck. His first birthday parade took command last autumn. Been deployed to Afghanistan on three occasions. acknowledging in this instance the lead gun prominently on display in effect the color of the troop that's the status these 13 pounder quick fire guns which entered service in 1904 and all six on parade today used in the first world war it's taken 12 hours of work to prepare the guns to be in the prime condition they're in for this parade King's Troop, of course, has kept the title King's Troop on the orders of the Majesty of the Queen in memory of her late father, George VI, who chose the original name King's Troop 70 years ago. Field officer of the Sovereign's Escort, Major James Harbord, was on parade two years ago as an escort commander. As field officer, he commands the household cavalry troops on parade today. And the uh, standard bearer, Corporal Major Daniel Sentence. Watched by uh, his wife Lucy and parents in the stands. He's riding Kimberley. A word about Daniel, Chris. 
Well, for the squad, for the standard bearer, Court Major Daniel Sentence, not the first time he's worked with the Irish Guards. When I was commanding the Irish Guards in Afghanistan in 2010 and 11, we worked very closely with the Household Cavalry Squadron. And I remember uh, Court Major Daniel Sentence in that squadron. It's great to see him working with the Irish Guards again. And a further emphasis on the dual roles, ceremonial and operational, across the whole Household Division. Here come the Blues and Royals. Household Cavalry, of course, consisting of two regiments, Lifeguards and Blues and Royals, the two senior regiments of the British Army. And the Farriers, with their glinting axes, they're the ones in times gone by who would dispatch horses injured in battle. Officer's trumpeter is Trooper Joe Gregg of the Lifeguards. It's his first birthday parade. He's from Orkney. Didn't set out to be a trumpeter, he tells us, but says it's a great honour to be part of important occasions such as this. The trumpeter's horse is grey, so that it's very visible uh, on the battlefield. So a dramatic surge of speed and pace and energy the trot past. King's Troop, who were recently deployed to central London, sporting the police in key locations, including Downing Street, as part of Operation Tempera. It's a good moment for us to pay tribute to all members of the armed forces, and indeed all members of the emergency services, who've shown exceptional dedication in recent months, faced with some very harrowing circumstances. Galaxy today, very experienced uh, parade commander's charger. Each of the, uh, the guns pulled by six horses, kicking up a lot of dust on this very dry parade ground today in the sun on horse guard. And at the rear we have the masters of the troop. And the first ever female master tailor, by the way, in the British Army, Sergeant Emma Colton joined the King's Troop 11 years ago, responsible for all the uniform being worn today by the regiment. Turn of the lifeguards to trot past Her Majesty. Sovereign standard presented to the regiment three years ago, carrying 43 battle honours, including Passchendaele in 1917, and that battle will be commemorated in special events at the end of July in Belgium. Led by the Assistant Director of Music, Captain James Marshall, Band of the Household Cavalry presents its own birthday tribute. Kettle drummers riding the drum horses, crossing their sticks in their special form of salute for the Queen. Musicians look magnificent wearing the state coat, which signals that they are members of the royal household. Crimson velvet, gold braid and lace. It's the oldest ceremonial uniform in the regular army. It's been 
pretty much unchanged since 1685. Band of the Hustle Cavalry moving to the other end of the parade ground near the old Admiralty building where the assistant director of music will come to a halt and turn inward slightly and that is the signal that he's handing back control to the field officer ready for that final birthday salute to the Queen this birthday parade. Guards uh, taking up their dressing this time, all the guards in one very long line. This again is the result of very disciplined work on the parade ground, which we saw earlier at Burbright. into six divisions ready to march off the music played is the adjutant composed by drum major Tom Burkett so they're closing up now to reduce the length of the procession that will take place imminently along the map Quick, 
also as the Court of Drums play Prussia's Glory by Gottfried Wiebke guards uh, close up. And the pace stick being returned now to the regimental Sergeant Major Daniel Hinton by the orderly Guardsman Rainey. of the escort, Colour Sergeant Darren Lorimer. And making their way to the approach road as we come to the end of the parade, Garrison Sergeant Major, Warrant Officer Class 1, Andrew Stokes of the Coldstream Guards, accompanied by Drum Major Steve State. This is... Andrew Stokes' second birthday parade in such an important role. Joined the army in 1988. He served around the world in the meantime, including the Balkans and Iraq and Afghanistan. He is in charge of the arrangements for this parade on horse guards. And uh, there's a lot of responsibility on those very broad shoulders. Field officer prepares to ask Her Majesty's permission to march off to conclude this parade. Your Majesty's guards are ready to march off, ma'am. So another birthday parade concluded in the Queen's 91st year, the 65th year of the Queen's reign. And the formal part of the celebration, if you like, is over, but believe me, there is plenty of colour and pageantry and rousing music to come. There'll be the march along the Mall, all the guards, accompanied by uh, Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh. And then there'll be the fly past at around one o'clock by the Royal Air Force. 29 aircraft, it's going to be pretty spectacular. Some of those royal guests who are watching in the Horse Guards building have already left and they're making their way back to the palace ready for that appearance on the balcony. Prince Harry with Duchess of Cornwall and the Duchess of Cambridge. Extreme heat on horse guards today and that's clearly affected one or two of the members taking part. It's perfectly understandable. The Queen's carriage is now back at the saluting base, ready for the journey back with her troops, with the troops of the Household Division, her personal troops. Back to the area beyond St James's Park and the Mall and down to the Queen Victoria Memorial and Buckingham Palace itself. It's a wonderful, familiar journey. There will be thousands of people there to greet uh, Her Majesty and the Duke when they arrive. Been a very busy few days for 
members of the royal family. Yesterday, Her Majesty was in West London, visiting local people there after the dreadful events of recent days. That's very much been on Her Majesty's mind, given the statement that she released earlier today and the fact that she insisted on holding a one-minute silence before she set off for this parade. As she said in the statement, traditionally a day of celebration, but a sombre mood marking national events. She very much wanted to make that plain. having saved some of the very best tunes for the end of the parade as the bands always do because this is a great moment as well to showcase some of their best music once the parade is over and they've got a, a few minutes to perform for us as we watch the procession going back to Buckingham Palace. I should say as well Chris that for the field officer who of course has been in charge of this parade, it's quite a responsibility. This is also the moment where he may or may not get some direct feedback from the Queen, either on the procession or when they get back to the palace. Well, Hugh, I think he will, and I think the hard work, the training has paid off, and I think both he and all the guardsmen under his command can congratulate themselves on a job really well done. High standards of drill, excellent teamwork, concentration, physical stamina, They've all combined to give us a really first-class performance. And I think all Irish guardsmen, past and present, will want to join with me in congratulating the escort and the other guards on a job really well done. As you said, Her Majesty the Queen, as the Colonel-in-Chief, will also have a view. And Jonathan Palmer can expect to be thoroughly debriefed back at Buckingham Palace. But having watched the parade, I don't think he's got anything to be worried about there. I did mention the heat, Chris, and I think it's worth saying something about that because uh, it's not surprising that the intense heat here has affected one or two people, but it's certainly not impaired on the quality of the parade. Absolutely not, and I think it's a testament to all the troops on parade that they've delivered an absolutely first-class performance, despite some really challenging conditions. Well, we are staying on air here on BBC One to see this procession back to Buckingham Palace, to see that birthday fly past by the Royal Air Force, which the Queen and members of the Royal Family will be enjoying from the famous balcony of Buckingham Palace, and there'll be thousands there to enjoy the fly past too. The tradition, by the way, of the monarch leading the guards back to Buckingham Palace was established by George V back in 1940, just over a century ago. At that time, the parade had become so popular, uh, it was decided to provide an even more impressive experience for the thousands of spectators. It's no less popular today. Senior drum major and colleagues leading the way with the mass bands perform magnificently today. We were talking to Scott Fitzgerald during the week and Scott was greatly looking forward to this, his final parade. And during the Queen's 65 years on the throne, the armed forces, of course, have been through a great deal of change. But the participants in the birthday parade have remained remarkably constant, really. Five regiments of foot guards, two regiments of the Hussle Cavalry, making up the Hussle Division, plus, of course, the horse-drawn guns of the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. I love this uh, vista, which looks down the mile towards Buckingham Palace, the grand ceremonial route designed by Sir Aston Webb in the early 20th century. So familiar to the Queen and the Royal Family. It's featured every great event of her reign and before that too. This is where she travelled to a wedding in November 1947. Vast crowds there as well, of course, for other royal weddings and the decades that followed. It's been a feature to on more sombre occasions 
such as her father's funeral in 1952 and her mother's funeral uh, in 2002. A word about the street liners, because they perform such a valuable function. 12 officers, 220 men from 1st Battalion Coldstream Guards lining the processional route from Buckingham Palace to Horse Guards, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel James Thurston, who was the field officer at the parade last year. Um, and Chris, there's a danger sometimes to maybe overlook the street liners because of what's going on on Horse Guards Parade, but it's very important to underline what they do. Absolutely, Hugh. Um, the street liners play a fundamental role role in this parade formed today from the 1st Battalion Coldstream Guards. They provide spectacle and colour back along the Mall, and it'll be an important moment for them as the Queen and the Royal Procession pass them on their way back up to Buckingham Palace. You mentioned the fact that the Welsh Guards, for example, today were represented by Kevin Roberts and some of the musicians in the bands. It's important for us to recognise who's not here today. Indeed, Hugh, three battalions not represented today, the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards, 1st Battalion Scots Guards and the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards. They're busy preparing for operational duty. They're part of the UK's high readiness forces and they're likely to deploy in the next year to furnish the UK's enduring commitments in the Middle East and in Afghanistan. So exciting and important work that they're engaged in at the moment. And as we enjoy these images, we see the, uh, the, the, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh enjoying the, the crowds and the sights and the sounds and the music. A word too about the regimental adjutants because we sometimes don't get a good glimpse of them, but uh, there are six of them, and I'm just wondering, could you tell us a little bit about them, Chris, and especially Colonel Timothy Purden, who's, uh, who's in his last uh, parade as regimental adjutant? Well, that's right, Hugh. Riding at the rear of the Royal Procession are the six regimental adjutants of the Household Division. They're retired officers of the division who run the parts of the regiment outside the service battalions. And I suppose they're a reflection of that service in the household division has lifelong connections and they undertake some really important work with our veterans. And you're right to mention uh, the Irish Guards regimental adjutant, Colonel Tim Purden, retiring this year after over 45 years service to the regiment. Uh, an important uh, the family connection carried on. His son, James, served with me in Afghanistan in 2010. Royal Standard, fluttering above uh, Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria Memorial. And there we can see the progress of the troops and the mass bands and the household cavalry as they make their way back to Buckingham Palace. And as we look forward to the events leading to that balcony appearance and the birthday fly past, I'm delighted once again to welcome uh, to the commentary box the journalist, author, commentator Robert Hardman who writes for the Daily Mail. Robert, a warm welcome once again. Thank you. Hugh. Our thoughts on today's parade where the Queen clearly wanted to combine a sombre message, insisting on that one minute silence, combining that with of course a parade which is all about celebration. Well, you monarchy stands for many things of course, uh, continuity, keeping calm and carrying on but at the same time representing the nation to itself in times of both triumph and tragedy and I, I really think we've seen that very clearly today. Let's also remember this is a day that's perhaps the nearest we have to a United Kingdom National Day. The Queen's very conscious of that uh, in, in British embassies, British High Commissions, British communities all over the world. Uh, today is the day uh, for putting out flags. Uh, France may have Bastille Day, the Americans may have July the 4th. Um, for the British uh, around the world, it's the Queen's birthday, and, uh, and that's why it, it matters in so many other ways. The tone of the message earlier today, Robert, really was in keeping with the kind of tone set by the Queen and by the Duke of Cambridge when they visited West London yesterday. Yes, Hugh, I was there at uh, the Westway Centre in uh, uh, Kensington yesterday, uh, and it was abundantly clear what the presence of the Queen and the Duke of Cambridge meant to the entire community. It's, it's sometimes thought that perhaps the monarchy is governed by rigid protocol and doing things by the book, but as we've seen in recent weeks, um, the Queen has been very quick to adapt and reflect um, what people are thinking, what people are feeling. At the same time she was there yesterday, the Prince of Wales holding an investiture at Buckingham Palace. Uh, he paused, there was a minute's silence uh, there too for that. Uh, and, and we're seeing uh, time and again that, that you know, these moments, uh, it's, it's, monarchy is about being there in the highs and the lows.
And we've seen too, uh, Robert, as we look now at the uh, the progress down the mile, and it's uh, it's a great sight again. All the greenery of St James's Park, and of course Green Park there to the left, leading up to Piccadilly. Um, we can see that the uh, the sovereign's procession uh, is almost back at the point where the gates and the carriage gates of uh, Buckingham Palace open before us. A thought about the busyness of the royal timetable, and the fact, of course, that that timetable has had to be adjusted quite considerably for some very big events. Yes, uh, next week uh, we were expecting the state opening in Parliament on Monday. That's now moved to Wednesday. The Queen has now um, uh, rewritten the diary twice for next week. The uh, Order of the Garter, the, the oldest order of chivalry, always meets on the Monday before uh, Monday after this event. That's that was cancelled because of the state opening. Uh, we've got a state visit coming up very shortly. The state visit of the King of Spain, which will bring all the, all the royal household, all its the different components together for that. Uh, the Queen's got her full week of events up in Scotland at Holyrood House. These are all very important parts of the calendar. And, uh, and then at the same time, as we've seen, um, she's she's changing uh, changing the diary uh, all the time. And at the same time, you know, this week I was at a very touching ceremony in the East End, London's East End, on Thursday, where the Queen and the Duke were there to mark the centenary of the first daylight air raid on London in 1917, when a bomb dropped on a primary school, killing 18 children. A very, very moving service. And then a, a trip to that school as it stands today, a remarkable school in, uh, in Tower Hamlets. And, and, and once again, a, a day of very powerful cons contrasting scenes. mentioned earlier, Hugh, of course, uh, that this is uh, the Queen's 65th birthday parade, a, a, a record in this Sapphire Jubilee, as you said, another record. Um, but as we see the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh coming down the mile, it's worth reflecting. I mean, these, these two really have rewritten the royal record books um, in so many ways, our longest lived, longest reigning monarch. But I think perhaps it's worth remembering uh, the great uh, upcoming um, uh, landmark the Queen's perhaps looking forward to most of all uh, in November when she will mark uh, with the Duke the first ever royal platinum wedding anniversary. Duke today not in uniform for the first time at this parade, uh, Robert. Um, he is, of course, Colonel of the Grenadier Guards. Um, and people will be reflecting today as we see the Queen with the uh, Duke at her side, as he always is. But the fact that from the autumn, his commitment will change considerably. Yes, he's announced he's going to scale back um, his engagements. Um, he's still um, attached to some 780 organizations around the world, and, and uh, he's a very practical man. He's uh, thinking about how to sort of hand all those batons on. Um, but at the same time, we've been told, you know, he, he will still turn up at certain events. And I, I think um, the way that this has been announced is quite clever. It means it's not an obligation on him to attend certain things. We don't have to expect him here and there. We don't have to worry when he's not at certain things. But I do think when the big events come up, and we, you know, we look ahead to things like the Spanish state visit, a possible state visit by, by President Trump, and next year a huge Commonwealth Summit. I think we can certainly expect to see him at the Queen's side for those big occasions. And your thoughts about the way that the royal family has managed to reshape, the, I suppose, the engagement and involvement of younger royals over the past of the last few years, but we're now really seeing it in great evidence. Yes, we are, Hugh. The, this, this sense of uh, what some call Team Windsor, uh, in, 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 a, in a gentle, understated way, no, no big uh, headline um, replacement. Um, but but here and there, members of the royal family, other members of the royal family, um, representing the Queen. That first and foremost, what they all do, in addition to all their own personal interests, their, their primary role is to support and represent the Queen. Uh, and we are seeing that uh, time again, uh, whether it's at an investiture, visits overseas, uh, or, uh, or day to day in, in, around the country. It's pretty hard work, I imagine, marching and playing and contending with the heat, but uh, it's certainly not undermining the performance. The music is, uh, is as rousing and as spectacular as ever, and the Queen and Duke are clearly enjoying uh, surveying the scene on this uh, great day of the birthday parade.
Duke of Edinburgh, of course, Colonel of the Grenadier Guards, who visited their barracks to present the uh, the Manchester Trophy at the annual inter-company football match. That was just uh, a few months ago. Still very, very devoted to, to the regiment. And not forgetting, of course, it's just a few years ago that the Queen presented the Duke with uh, the title and office of Lord High Admiral of the Navy. That was to mark his 90th birthday. So lots of members of the royal family on the balcony, just greeting Her Majesty and the Duke as they return home to Buckingham Palace. Prince Harry there and the uh, Earl of Wessex, the Duke of York, Duchess of Cornwall, just acknowledging some of the waves below. And very soon we will have uh, the Queen and the Duke appearing too on the balcony ready for that uh, RAF fly past. And there we see the Duchess of Cornwall talking to the Duchess of Cambridge. It's an important birthday year for the Duchess of Cornwall, who will be 70 next month and is looking forward to a party with all her charities. Some young ones on the balcony there. Uh, Robert, are we expecting to see some more young ones? It would be nice, wouldn't it? We saw Princess Charlotte make her debut last year, and uh, the Duchess of Cambridge um, is, is uh, there as well, with Prince George maybe in the background. Um, let's wait and see what... What emerges? We shall see. Um, we've not long to wait anyway. Um, well, very soon thousands of spectators will have reached uh, beyond the confines of St James's Park. They'll be right down there towards uh, Buckingham Palace. Here on Horse Guards, I can tell you that uh, there's a huge crowd making its way down towards the palace. So all of the gardens there through the Queen's Gardens, from Canada Gate on the left all the way around to the right, and there you have St James's Park ahead of you, which has been a royal park for many centuries, and at one point even housed a zoo and a menagerie. Uh, but not these days, it's one of the nicest parks in London to spend a few hours in, especially on a day like today. So lots of people enjoying the atmosphere, and Sonali, my colleague, uh, is joined now by um, Major Richard Chambers of the Lifeguards um, to talk to him about the day's events. Richard, your role is to make sure everyone's riding is up to scratch, and also the horses, that includes them too. Absolutely. Were you pleased with what you've seen today? Uh, yeah, very pleased. The horses, obviously with the temperature as it was, behaved themselves well, and the, and the guys rode really well as well. Yes, because part of your role is also to make sure that they don't get spooked out by the noise, the bands, the crowds here. Yeah, we do a lot of conditioning training towards that. Uh, we've got the, the luxury of Hyde Park, we've got our own mounted bands, so we can, we can do a lot of that work as well. So. How tough will this heat, you mentioned it, how tough will it have been on everyone out there on parade? Um, the guys will certainly have felt it. I mean, you know, as soon as you put this uh, uniform on, you start to, to heat up and then you know, the temperature is about 27 degrees, I think it is today. They will have certainly been feeling it out there today. Do you think you can relax now? Once they're off and they're <laughs> back at camp, I, then I'll relax. And obviously every horse that we've got on the parade, once we know they're all back in, and we'll check them when we get back and make sure that they're all safe and sound, ready for the next parade. It really has been a wonderful day, hasn't it? The atmosphere, all the crowds, everyone's just been really, really enjoying it and together. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been amazing, um, you know, just, just having the numbers on the streets and, and the environment of Horse Guards Parade is, is just fantastic when you're in there and it's full. So. Richard, I'm glad you can relax soon. Not just yet, but soon. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Sonali with uh, just one of those playing an important part uh, in today's parade. So they prepare to change the guard in the uh, forecourt of uh, Buckingham Palace. Does we enjoy this site, uh, Chris? Why don't you explain to us what's going on here and relate that to some of those actually who've already been working hard in the parade? Well, Hugh, uh, not many people know that when the escort get back to Buckingham Palace, um, the parade may have ended for a lot of people, but for them, they go on to conduct the normal changing of the guard. 
And I remember when we got to this point back in 1996, we were tired but were still determined to conduct an absolutely flawless changing of the guard. Uh, the off-going guard, the people on the right-hand side of the screen there, will be expecting it. Uh, but this is where individual physical fitness comes in. This is a physically demanding task. And the guards in training will have prepared them for this. So there's no loss in performance despite the very hot temperatures. How long will they be on duty and uh, uh, maintaining this duty now for? Well, Hugh, the guardsmen who go onto the sentry boxes now uh, will have a one or two hour sentry duty on top of having completed the Queen's birthday parade. So uh, a pretty significant task for them. So just uh, thinking about the men who are now confronted with a little more duty, as I say, in the glorious sunshine. Horse Guards Parade and the Mall, of course, playing host to today's spectacular events, but Buckingham Palace too, right at the centre of events now, as the, the parade has concluded. The old soldier, the two lads corporal, and the junior sergeant, though. Ah! Up in the Palace of Tuscan, it was one to four.